Right, should we should we get started yes. then? I suppose yes. Why not? It's seven o'clock. Well, hello everybody. Um, thanks very much for, for coming out. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm John Taylor. I'm the owner of the Vets up the road here, Mansion Hill Vets, and um, this is the first time I've done this talk actually. So you are the kind of the you're the test group because it's something I'm 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 very interested in and, and pretty passionate about. Um, some time ago, I. Um, I was catching up with an old girlfriend of mine who uh, has started a really excellent um, online group called Canine Arthritis Management. You, you all come across it, Cam. Um, she's, she's absolutely singularly minded about it. And while she's not a specialist in, in that area, she's managed to gather a group of people around her. And we had her come out to the sur surgery uh, a couple of years ago and they, they did a really good talk and we had some um, pain management specialists in there. and. The stuff that they were coming out with really fired me up to, to go and start investigating stuff more because um, although I'm a vet, I'm also I'm also an Iron Man. So you know that's my that's what I like to do. And now I'm hitting my mid forties, the body's starting to fall to pieces a little bit, <laughs> and keeping this show on the road is getting harder and harder. To be honest with you, so that's that's me in a bin bag, at Lanzarote. So. You know, I feel like probably a lot of your dogs feel uh, at the end of a, a competition in, in that photo. So I've got an awful lot of empathy with them. And over the last couple of years, I've been doing an awful lot of training um, with uh, specialists around the country to kind of see what else we can do. Because I'm guessing that the majority of you um, have some kind of sports athletic dog. So shooting dogs, agility dogs, any other kind of dogs you've got here, scent work, that sort of stuff. No? Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. And um, I got pretty bored with the, the same old, you know, you have an injury, you know, butte and box rest you say for the horses, but rest and, you know, some kind of pain relief. And I think it's a really easy trap for everyone to, to fall in, to think that yeah, painkillers and, and rest are going to fix everything. And, you know, let's face it, you know, animals get better despite us, not because of us. You know, nature is the greatest healer. But there's lots of other things that we can do to kind of work around to and and help help these these dogs and certainly um you know talking to hannah and, and cam you know their emphasis isn't so much on the pain related stuff it's environmental modifications and stuff like that so um i i was writing this talk and then it turned into about a three hour marathon and then I started cutting it down again, and then there wasn't the bits. I, so this is like a selected highlights of what I what I find interesting out there, um, but it is by no means comprehensive. There, there's lots of other stuff. So what I intend to do tonight? How long have we got, Sally? About an hour or something like that. Yeah, something like that. So I'll chat away until sort of ten to because I can just blather for hours otherwise. And you know, if at any point you want to stop me and ask a question, just just shout out, or you can ask questions at the end whenever I'm, I'm really open to, to it so um what we're going to cover tonight a um, little bit on appropriate training rehabilitation now sally tells me there's a physio here tonight who's the physio <laughs> right okay brilliant we might skip over rehabilitation <laughs> <laughs> uh, where the fly is uh, stem cell and uh, platelet rich pr uh, uh, plasma therapy some common sort of injuries and issues that we see out there, um, intra-articular, other joint therapies, advances in painkillers as well, because uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and, and how, you can, how you can protect your dog. Uh, so let's get on to appropriate training. I mean, when you guys get your animals out of the, the back of the van, how many of you warm them up? Okay, so about three of you. All right, so I can tell you from experience that it takes me about 15 minutes these days to get to a stage where my body's starting to, to, to pump. So warming up is really important, especially as you get older and especially if there are pre-existing injuries. There are a number of physiological changes that happen during wa um, warming up. So your body starts to vasodilate, your heart rate starts to go up. Vasodilation, essentially blood vessels start to expand muscles start to warm they come up by a couple of degrees they become more supple um, and they become less likely to get injured okay uh, so warming up is actually quite an important part of everything it doesn't have to be anything mega you know certainly for me i tend to go to 
try and get my heart rate up to about 100 or so. So it's like a fast walk. That's all you need to do. And if your dog's going to be doing anything like, a, I don't know, fly ball, where they're going to be doing fast turns, try and warm up those sort of motions that they're going to, to be using. Because they've just been sat, they've been sat very still. They come out and they've got Collie just explosion fireworks in their head and they're going to go at it maximum attack. And that's where they're going, going to hurt themselves. If they're getting out, they're cold and they go straight into full-blooded work. Um, yeah. Done a yeah. So generally, um, I, I reckon for, for, for mammals around about 10, 15 minutes or so, and then you start to warm down again. Uh, and warming down is actually quite important as well. So after you've done a, uh, an intense session of exercise, if your dog's done an intense session of exercise, there's all kind of things like free radicals floating around in the muscles. There's a lot. There's, there's muscle damage happening. There's tendon damage happening. There's ligament da uh, damage happening. So actually, just warming down, which is the reverse of warming up. So like a fast walk again, you can help just flush all those out, out, out of the system. So and it allows all that vasoconstriction to come back as well. I don't know if you you agree with me on this. Warming yeah, warm, warm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know. If, if, if nothing else, I'd say those top two things, if you do those for your animals, that will keep them uh, active, healthily active for longer. So re really important. I think a lot of us are sort of guilty. You know, I do it with my dogs. I get them out into the field and I let the clip off and they go bombing off, but they're going from zero to 100 miles an hour and we expect them to run around. And that, that is how they're going to injure themselves. And it's, we also think, um, just uh, related to that, you know, we also, when we talk about injuries, we often think about, you know, that big, big injury, that, that su sudden thing that happens. But actually, there's lots of micro traumas happening all the time. This is why we get fit, because when, when we're training, we're not actually getting much fitter. It's during the recovery phase that we're putting muscle on, the body's making the adaptations, it's producing more red blood cells, the heart's expanding. That's when all the adaptation phase is happening. Actually, during exercise, what you're doing is you're causing little micro traumas through the body. This is why rest is really important. That, that's, when, that's when your dogs are, are going to be getting fitter. So we, we, we apply a stimulus, and then we withdraw it and we relax and we let that stimulus sink in. So the body repairs, you know, the tendons get tougher, the cartilage gets tougher, the muscles expand, the red blood cells, like I say, you get more of those, the overall oxygen carrying, that all happens at rest. And again, too many of us are guilty of just exercise, 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 and just the same sort of exercise the whole time. Whereas actually that rest phase is, is really, really important for them. Um, training to activity level. So whatever you're expecting them to be able to do in the ring, you should be training them towards that in a slow manner. And don't just focus on that one particular, if you're focused on say fly ball, you do nothing but fly ball with your dog all day long, that's when you're gonna get repetitive injuries because you're using the same muscle groups, you're using the same, the same tendons are taking the strain each time. You know, think about maybe doing longer runs. The only way you can you can vary these things. This is, uh, and, and training to competence. I was talking to Hannah about this earlier on as well. You know, be realistic about what, what your dog's going to be able to do because young dogs are going to be able to do more than old dogs. Um, as your dog gets older, so you've got an old shooting dog, something like that, might need a little bit more warming up. You might need to put them in the, back in the car a little bit earlier, th those sorts of things. So it kind of seems sensible, doesn't it? But actually, you know, three people out of how many are here tonight are actually doing warming up so you know that that is all going to give rise to problems late, later in life um, I yeah. so generally I reckon at least a day a week um, for a young animal but as you get older probably two days a week yeah as the animals get older so from when, sort when of rest is that like so active, sure, really. active recovery, oh, yeah, yeah. Not just sat there doing <coughs> nothing, okay. but going out for a short lead walk, okay. no throwing the ball, that sort yeah. of thing. Just, you know, stretching out the muscles, allowing things just to, to relax. I don't know how many of you go for a run and the next day you're absolutely, you know, you're as stiff as a board. You know, getting out and doing a walk and stretching those muscles out again, it re really, really helps. That's quite funny because we go up to Yorkshire and do quite a lot on set. Sunday, yeah. The dogs are out at in, almost like interval training. Yeah, yeah. And we rest them up for two days after that. Right. But I always used to 
tag line for a gentle off the lead walk or yeah. gallop around the field just to loosen off and I was told yeah. actually that was bad. No, I, I think a loosening off is good, but you know, it's got to be you can't be like you're doing another yeah. set of exercises. Oh, yeah, with no, this, them. this was just like this yeah. is more downtime. Yeah. Yeah, so going for it, yeah. you know, for us it'd be like the equivalent of going for a ge very gentle jog yeah. or a swim or, or something like that. The athlete, yeah, warming down or running down. The yeah, next day. yeah, a absolutely. And you know, just getting that heart rate up and getting the blood going back through the again, it, again, it takes out those free radicals, all the things that are doing the damage in there, and it helps them to to heal it a little bit faster. It's been shown in in, in studies. Um, so rehabilitation. Um, so this is a few things that I, I thought I'd go through here with you, um, not knowing a physio was going to be here with us tonight. Uh, do you do laser therapy? Um, I have a red light unit and my colleague who I work with has a class 4 laser. Right. So class 2 plus class 3 we use laser. Does she? Yeah. Good, good. I'm glad about this. Um, so you will, uh, the reason, so tonight I'm assuming a certain amount of knowledge and you know a certain amount of use of these sorts of services so um, I'm going to just point things out rather than go through the whole gamut of things so laser laser light therapy doesn't work doesn't work by warming up the uh, the muscles the light penetrates a few muscle uh, a few millimeters and essentially it, it changes the physiology it changes the metabolism again these free radicals get get dispersed better um, the reason why I put class 4 versus class 3B because there's a bit of an arms race going on amongst the laser manufacturers and you know bigger is better. Well, not necessarily when you're lasering something. So a class 4 laser has a w higher wattage output, but actually they've not been able to show any kind of physiological benefit. Aside, well, the, only, the, the downside of a class 4 is it's very easy to burn an animal. So some of these things are... Um, I don't know. Class, some some class fours are in the hands of, pre, uh, of people that perhaps they shouldn't be in the hands of. So be very 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 careful. And I would always say when you're going to to get laser therapy, I would always go to an associated chartered physiotherapist for something like that because the, there is a potential to cause harm. I think class four are regulated. Class three B aren't. I can't remember the regulations behind it. I don't know something like that. Know. I can't remember it off the top off the yeah, top of my head. Four to me is like you say more dangerous than Yeah, um, that's it. Without the benefits. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so that's that about laser really. I, I think laser therapy, uh, you know, that there's a lot of studies out there to support it. Um both uh, well, in rehabilitation, wound healing, um, all kinds of things. It just seems to speed up healing. Um Hydrotherapy, I think this is something that's very underused. I think hydrother hydrotherapy, but also hydro exercise as well. So hydro... We are hydro, we are hydro. Aha, excellent, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Doing your job for you up here. I think hydrotherapy as a, as a non-impact causing form of exercise is, is really, really excellent. It uses slightly different muscles. You can... There's more of a, a, a range of motion through the joints when they're, when they're swimming as well. A lot of dogs enjoy it. Um, with therapy, definitely, you know, warmer water has been shown to sort of um, uh, improve rates of healing just because the animals are a bit warmer. There isn't that cold shock where all the blood vessels contract and all the blood goes crashing towards the, 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 the core. Um, but as exercise, I think swimming in general is pretty good, whether it's in a pool or out in you know ponds or lakes or, or whatever I remember many years ago I did a um, it was a luxating patella and one of the partners that, uh, the partners dogs that I was working at in the practice and I said you know and he was called Taylor as well I said, Mr Taylor after we've done this you know we need to look at some kind of hydrotherapy to get motion back into this joint not a problem not a problem uh, a couple of weeks later one of my other clients came in and said that he would found him on a bridge with a long piece of, I don't know, it must have been washing line, and the dog just swimming upstream, da da downstream of him. This was 20 years ago or so. But, you know, th that's probably not going to do a great deal of good. Um, so did it work? <laughs> <laughs> he was happy. He didn't fire me anyway, so there you go. Um, physiotherapy, you know, I'm, I'm a big supporter of physiotherapy, and I think the sooner the better. As soon as you can get dogs that have had injuries into physiotherapies, 
the better. And I will include dogs that have had disc prolapses. You know, as soon as the wound has healed, if there's been any kind of surgery, you should be looking to get them to a, to a, to a physiotherapist. I, I think it makes all the difference, getting ranges of motion back into joints that are injured. All that fibrotic tissue, which is kind of accreting in an area that you've done surgery on, basically what it does, it's like, I don't know, like cement over it, and then it contracts down and it just restricts that, um, that, that freedom of movement in the joint. And so then they can't use the joint properly afterwards and it takes a lot more effort to get this thing to heal. So getting the physiotherapy in there sooner rather than later definitely really helps. Can I ask one? Yeah, sure. Also, the physiotherapy, we look very much at the quality of movement of the mm. whole dog. Yeah. A lot of dogs will have compensated in yes. subtle ways in yeah. other areas. Mm. And certainly before you go on a strengthening programme, if you can get that quality and also mm. better and yeah. control around the joint, then your strengthening program is going to come for free kind of thing. It's going to, the dog's going to strengthen in the best way possible. Yeah. So the whole quality of movement is something that a physio will concentrate on as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember going to a physio a few years back and, you know, she said to me, I, I had a terrible limp at the time, and she said, just go go slower, but try and um, try and avoid the limp, try and walk normally. And it's all about developing these patterns in our brain, isn't it? Get those neural pathways. Um, some just, and as an aside on that, we've had um, a lot of success with um, dogs which have had uh, disc prolapses and they've got very mal-coordinated on, the, on their hind legs and we go to physiotherapists and it's amazing how, how plastic the brain is at relearning how to walk. I mean, it's incredible, you know, just re relearning how to um, think around the bits of the brain that are damaged. So, you know, it's a, our body is, it's not static it's constantly either respo it's responding to a stimulus and that stimulus is either uh, um, uh, improved so it's athletic so you know strength or aerobic or we're not doing anything and it's in recovery phase or maybe it's declining slightly as well you know it's constantly going up and down it's, it's a very very dynamic process can i just ask a question swimming yeah. or treadmill as in like a hydro treadmill or or yeah so I, I like a hydro treadmill, actually. I think for dogs which are scared of the pool, yeah. I mean, it, it encourages a more high stepping gait. Is that, do you do hydro treadmills? No, we do pool. Pool, yeah. But I've been, we've been trained, I've been trained on treadmills now. Yeah, so you, get, you do get quite, they kind of get their, their legs out. Depends how, how, how full it is. Um, of the two of them, I don't think I'd recommend perhaps one over the other. I don't know whether you guys would. The treadmill, I would say, it can be a lot more functional. You can work a lot more on the Mm -hmm. again. Um, so it can be, it can be less wild. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't force the joint through a yeah. big range. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I personally like high uh, treadmill if you're rehabbing something. Yeah. I think swimming for fitness oh and for weight loss is fantastic. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The, um, it's the gate re-education with the treadmill, so you mm. can really replace the feet, everything like that. Yeah. Uh, the pool, I'd say, in some ways you're obviously building if they are unable to weight bear through maybe a joint, then the pool is something better for that mm -hmm. because they wouldn't be able to pull it down on the treadmill anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but with the water, you would you adjust the level to mm -hmm. the area for problems if it's the shoulder, then you'd bring it up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask something else? Of course. Is there a minefield out there? Because there's physio, <laughs> there's massage therapists, there's chiropractors. Yeah, yeah. How do we know? So. Giving us the quality treatment. So is it ACPAT? ACPAT is the task. The physios? Ram, registered animal musculoskeletal therapy. Mm. Ram mm. is the one that includes the osteos, chiros, and the non-ACPAT but similar experience now mm. is the registered for the most highly qualified, basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask about massage because I always take my dogs to be massaged because they work hard, but mm. is that less useful, do you think, than... A physio? Is no, it? not necessarily. I think um, sometimes a, a, a sorry, I don't mean to. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes, if your dog hasn't got an injury or they're not moving difficulty or not having a difficulty with their sport, the, then having something like a massage. Th that's nice that's very true. Yeah. Um, if you've got any concerns about lack of. Um, there's, there's no evidence to suggest that massage will speed up the rate of rehab at all. Okay. So, but like, like you say, from a, you know, a, a nice thing to do and relaxation and working through things, the, the, then, yeah, I, you know, I think it's good. But I, I would hesitate to recommend massage for 
you know, a specific rehab reason. We use it to sort of try and more preventative than anything else. Mm. Mm. Maintenance, so yeah. I'm sure you would use it as a, a as an Iron Man yourself, as a. I I do, but it, I use very even, I, even post. You, if, if you go to a, a massage, a sports massage therapist after you see only because it feels uh, good, but the medical evidence suggests it, yeah yeah. Time, yeah. You know. There's no evidence suggests it helps at all. Um, it's ice baths help. Combined with some form of um, exercise, <coughs> stretches, or, or yeah. And I yeah. mean, by combined, I mean combined within de that day of recovery for a sports person. Mm. They'll be doing some yeah. Pilates like or balance exercises, stretches, or something mm. else. Yeah. So combined with it. Mm. I, 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 I do do massage sometimes, so I've, I have a problem, I've got old man calf syndrome apparently, <laughs> which is like a load of fibrotic tissue in the middle of my calf muscle, and so I have a big stick with a ball on it that I really use to kind of try and break that fibrotic tissue down, it seems to help a bit, but you know, I know exactly where to go and I'm just not convinced that you can do that on dogs. Um, orthotics, and by these I mean braces of, of various different types, slings, straps, all that sort of thing. The only evidence with these to say they help is when they are properly fitted, they're individually fitted and they're managed correctly. I, I see umpteen, I've seen lots and lots of problems with orthotics rubbing, they don't seem to do very much. The other thing to consider is we all put braces on and you know what's the point of these things a lot of the time, you know, you, someone says it supports my joint, well you've got you know, really seriously thick ligaments around these joints which are holding everything together. I think for people, sometimes it gives, it's like a, a feeling of feeling safe. It perhaps draws your attention to the area so you guard it a little bit more. But you know, I see um, like elbow splints out there with, with a hinge on it. Now, if you look at the way dog's elbows work, it's a camming motion. That's the way our elbows work. So it comes down and it twists as it comes down. A lot, these joints are, aren't just simple hinges, they, they have twists and they, they have very complicated motions through them and quite often what we find with orthotics is that they artificially limit the movement of that joint to a particular, to a particular plane and then you get rubbing. Um, interesting enough, and we'll come on to this later on, the latest generation of elbow replacements have solved the problem in the early ones. We, we found there was a lot of problem with loosening of the implant and it's because that, that camming hadn't been built into it and over time there was just twisting forces on the implant which just kept loosening it. So the latest generation now have, that, have, it, have it built in. So orthotics you, you need to be really, really careful of and to be honest I've, I've never had to use it. I've never had to use them. So all these, like I say, straps, hobbles, all that sort of thing, I just don't think they're this, worth this it. This is a little bit like the human though because um, they're stopping, from what, what I've been told, they don't issue crutches very much they're trying to get you to walk mm. on it because they actually start then compensating again yeah. wrongly and if you start bracing things, mm. all it does is put the pressure somewhere completely different. Yeah. So you're better off leaving that completely loose and if it feels painful, mm -hmm. it's telling your brain it is painful and don't do something stupid on it. Yeah. Limit it, but you keep still keep the movement. Keep moving. And you know, the, the orthopedic um, fracture repairs that we do now, it is it's 10 years since I've used a cast. You know, I, I want to stabilize that bone so that when they walk out, well, when they go out, they can walk on it. And you know, within a week or whatever, we can get them using physio. You know, the old idea of keeping something solid for six weeks is, is kind of, you know, for the birds, really. Um, so, stem cells. So, I've got a little bit of a, a video here. Um, I wonder if it'll see if we can get it to play. So, stem cells are, we'll come on to it in a moment, but this is an example of a, a dog that had some stem cells, not one that we treated, it was a dog up in Coventry. Um, so this dog that's quite stiff, he, I think he was, in, he was sort of nine, ten. You can see how he had arthritis actually. Um, you see how stiff he is there, very tentative, getting up, up and down. You'll see him in a moment, get onto his bed, trying to get onto his bed, you know, hesitating before he gets down. That's a spaniel, he should just be bounding on and off there. You know, painful as he's starting to sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then this is three weeks after he had some stem cells. 
So stem cells are now something that have been accepted. They, they've moved out of the slightly esoteric range and they're, they're accepted as um, good therapy. Um, you can see how much more able he is there to get around. I see some walking of him in a moment. I just thought this was a great video to show, show the difference just three weeks later. The tail's up, he's happier. We often forget just how unhappy some of these animals are when, when they're painful. What was his problem? Yeah, he, he had sort of arthritis, he had elbow arthritis, if I remember rightly. Um, <laughs> nice dog. Uh, and there, the head nod. So that you, everyone knows that you nod on the good, nod on the good leg. So if you want to know which one it is, every time the head goes down, nod, n nodding on the right shows that the left is is sore. And then three weeks later, nice even head cat. Well, there's a little bit of a nod there, but it's better than it was. So, has anybody come across stem cell therapy? You'll hear. Have you have you undergone it? Or? You, you have some, okay. PRP. Yeah, PRP. So stem cells are um, basically what we all grow from. They're that first cell that then differentiates into endoderm, ectoderm, then into bone, skin, muscle, that sort of thing. Um, there are lots of different types of, of, of stem cell. We tend to use what are called, rather than pluripotent stem cells, because you will read out there, you know, they could potentially cause cancer, because essentially you are implanting cells that can turn into a tissue. Um, therapy are multipotent stem cells. Multipotent means they're only going to turn into one or two types of tissue. There are two major ways that stem cell therapy is used at the moment. Uh, the first one is a section of fat is taken. Uh, it's sent away. There's a place up in Coventry that then cultures it. Um, they apply certain enzymes to it and they send the step they basically find these embryological stem cells in the fat encourage them to grow you send them back or you can take them out the bone marrow in general it's found that bone marrow stem cells are slightly better for the for the every every dog um, but for older dogs bone marrow recovery tends to be the best uh, with taking fat out obviously it goes away for two weeks it's two procedures um, with bone marrow stem cells, it's all one procedure because it's all processed in-house. Um, in bone marrow, basically they're taken out, they're centrifuged down, and they're re they're re we, we separate them out, and then we take those stem cells and we inject them into the joint. We are not rebuilding the joint, though. So everybody got, if you can imagine a joint, there's a bony surface which is covered by, I don't know, something like cartilage on, on the top of it. And then you've got this oily synovial fluid floating around and then another cartilage and then bone. When you see a damaged joint, and you'll see it later, you, that cartilage starts to break down. You get strands floating everywhere in, in, in it. Um, we're not rebuilding that cartilage, but what we are doing is we're putting cells in there which will turn into cells which will... Uh, produce synovial fluid so you get a better viscosity of the that means a greater thickness of the um, uh, uh, of the the fluid so you get easier movement of the joint and we also see an increase in sort of blood vessels and, and healing activity within the joint as well PRP is platelet rich plasma often given alongside stem cells PRP is prepared by taking a certain amount of blood, um, spinning it down, and taking the fraction that has uh, a lot of platelets in it. Platelets um, uh, carry a lot of growth factors which are highly anti-inflammatory. The benefits of these procedures are that you're not using drugs. You're using the dog's own cells. There's no kind of other effects. The worst thing that can happen is that nothing happens. But on average, um, papers show that 80% of dogs show significant improvements in the amount of pain that, 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 they're, that, they're, that, they're, that they have. So, you know, 80% of dogs will show less pain. Um, but the kind of time that this lasts over um, between 6 and 18 months, and it can be repeated afterwards. Younger dogs, it seems to last a little bit longer. Uh, dogs which are less affected, again, it seems to la last a little bit longer. So do you mind me asking what, what you had yours done for? Well, initially it was for iliopsoas injury. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So when the vet went over her, he mm. found that there was a shoulder issue mm. and also lumbosacral issues. Right, yeah. And the lumbosacral and the shoulder responded really well. Mm. Not sure about the idiocellus. Yeah. Um, some of the gait analysis and the stance analysis showed that there was a massive improvement. Mm. But she still hops, but right. she's happy. Yeah, you know, iliopsoas syndrome is quite, you know, quite complex, isn't it? Um, yeah, so the iliopsoas is the fillet muscle essentially running from about here to here. It's quite commonly damaged in greyhounds, any kind of dog which loves sprinting. Um, so it can be used in muscles, it can be used in tendons, it can be used in ligaments. I suppose the most common place that we're using at the moment is within joints. So I did one today. It was a German Shepherd with hip dysplasia, so we injected PRP and stem cells in, in, into the hip joint. I really like it because um, I've seen some great improvements w w with dogs that have had it, um, and it's it's a, it's a benign therapy. We'll come on to drugs and all the problems that they have. I hate talking about side effects because I don't believe there's such a thing as side effects. Every drug has a multitude of effects. You know, some of these drugs, you know, have extremely significant other effects and we need to again we, we want to like I was saying earlier we want to work with the kind of nature to help them to heal rather than fighting nature. So um, you're saying it, it stimulates the healing mm -hmm. process yeah. but kind of like skipping out the inflammatory phase going straight into proliferation. So the inflammatory f f yeah so inf inflammation f is basically when you get um, cytokines released or chemicals released into the surrounding cells which stimulate a certain response and one of the responses is pain but we also see um, vasodilation and things like that and then it moves on to, to a healing, healing um, response. Yeah so in terms of you don't get an, it doesn't cause inflammation essentially you sort of bite you're helping it skip to the healing phase yeah but what you're not doing is those cells that you're putting in they're not turning into cartilage and relining the joint, which is a common so misconception. They're, they're, they're multiplying into something. Yeah, so that so, so they're, they're new and delicate, and hence you wouldn't want lots of exercise. Yeah, so you know. generally we recommend two weeks uh, rest afterwards, and we also recommend that they shouldn't go on to any kind of non steroidals for a couple of weeks afterwards as well. Uh, Umeticams, Loxicoms, Carprofet, you know, Carpre, Rimadil, that sort of thing because they've been shown to adversely affect the survival rate of the stem cells. A lot of them will die anyway, um, but so long as you get a certain proportion to live through, uh, through rest and through appropriate pain management rather than using non yeah. By rest, are you talking 10 minute leave walks? Yeah, yeah, so walk? active recovery type stuff, yeah. Non-impactful, non-high non intensity so exercise. Could the physio be working on the other aspects like Definitely, and, 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 and there is evidence to suggest that laser therapy helps with these as well. So laser therapy, yeah, yeah. So, so again, you know, when we do this, when I, even when I take bone marrow out, you know, you've got a wound that big, it's healed within two or three days. I'd then be getting them to, if possible, go to a physio. I like laser therapy, remobilization of the joint. You know, training gait, etc., etc. I think that's all part of the the package so with these the things. So, the stem cell are the cells taken out of the, that dog? They're taken it's out not of like that dog. Like donor dogs, like you've got no, them, no, they're taken out of that dog. So okay. there's no no risk of rejection. Okay. So and no, hence no risk of you know those awful kind of donor rejection things or recipient rejection at syndromes that you can have. How big a procedure is it? Is it something? It's pretty big, you know, like the one today I think took us about three hours start to finish because it's a significant amount of processing of the stuff in between. Um, but that's anaesthetised or not? It's anaesthetised for, for the whole time. But in terms of effects on the dog, um, well they don't, it's, it's, it's a big procedure for us, it's, it's really kind of people intensive, yeah. um, but actually for dog what we do is make an, for, you know, the you either make an incision here and take a bit of fat out, which is just like taking a lump off, or you uh, you make a little incision here and then we push something called a, a jam sheedy needle, which is like a long knitting needle down into the middle of the femur and then we suck out some of the bone marrow. So there's just a tiny little wound there. And then there's the trauma of injecting it wherever you're going to inject it, you know. So usually, you know, for the day after, they potentially would be sore if they didn't have the right, right painkillers, but within a day or two, they're back up and running. 
Yeah, between six, it's very, very variable, but between six and 18 months. But certainly um, muscular injuries, joint problems, tendons, people are putting them everywhere. Into, even into, you know, sort of disc disease, you know, discs which are collapsing, people are now in, injecting in, straight into the discs, which is quite difficult. You've got to do it with um, MRI guidance, really, to, to do that. Um, but yeah, they, it's been shown to have great, great success. And, and cruciate disease, which we'll, we'll come on to as well. Certain types of cruciate disease, are, I should say. Roughly, what's the sort of cost about? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you should ask you, shouldn't I? Really, it depends on what. It can be a couple of thousand pounds by the time you're finished. Has anybody done any cost return analysis between that and other treatments? Uh, as in, like comparing it against? Well, I guess the only cost return you could have is, is let's say it worked for eighteen months, then you're looking at, you know, hundred quid a month, isn't it? Then, whereas. So yeah, there are lots of studies on that. And in fact, I, I put an article on, on our website and I, I've listed all the studies that I could find and downloaded them and kind of put them onto our, onto our website. So you're more than welcome to look at, look, at, look at those. But yeah, you're looking at probably, like I say, 80% of dogs showing some, some degree of improvement. We've not seen any signs of adverse effects with, with it, apart from the odd one that just doesn't seem to do anything for, and we're still at the, you know, this is kind of cutting edge stuff. We're still at the early stages of it and we don't know why. So I've, I've, you, we've used it in a, a few different situations. So the one today, it was a dog with hip dysplasia, yeah. German Shepherd, must be nine now, I guess, something like that. Um, we used it, we used it on him because he's painful it's and there's quality of life. yeah, quality of life thing. We've used it in younger dogs who've had um, sports injuries, so sort of muscular tears and things like that. We've used it in those, you know. We, yeah, for, for you know, yeah, for a, for a, so it's for a sports thing. Dogs that have had it and they've had it once and yeah. And back at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another dog, uh, a year-old bull mastiff um, with shoulder osteochondrosis discans (OCD), so uh, joint dysplasia. Um, used it in that as well, and it's worked really well for for him. Interestingly, in that dog, um, we. Uh, we'd, we'd done steroids in the first joint and then done um, uh, PRP and stem in, in the other one and the PRP and stem has outperformed the one with the steroids in, in the other side and steroids injections will come on to are problematic and they're still being recommended even in humans for tendons and things like that and actually ultimately they, they, they do cause problems steroids are useful in the right place so, um, I thought we'd come on to a few common things. Now, cruciate disease. Uh, anybody uh, had a dog with cruciate problems, ruptured cruciates? Yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. have. Is, is, is cruciate disease, is that when it's um, hereditary? So, yeah. So, it, it's uh, athletic dogs, but also dogs which... Uh, so, let, let me show you the video of what cruciate disease is. It's in the stifle. We're looking at a stifle here. Um, so we're looking, here's the, where the kneecap would be, in, and that's the cruciate coming through the, the cruciate. The cruciate ligament sits in a cross, and it prevents forward and backward movement of, of, of the tibia down here. So when the dog stands on it and the quadriceps contract, what we find is it pulls it all forward. So you'll see in a moment, and we get a sort of a grinding motion like that. So that's, that's, that's what cruciate, lig cruciate ligament disease is. As a result of that grinding motion, we see uh, damage to the, the medial meniscus. The meniscus is these little cushions here, cartilaginous cushions. As it's rubbing backwards and forwards, it's, it's damaging the, um, the meniscus, that, that cartilage pad. So there are lots of different ways of, of treating it. Uh, uh, left untreated, it's going to cause arthritis. But it's interesting what you say there, Sally, about what are the causes of this. Because we do, in, in humans, it's almost exclusively like skiers, rugby players, um, footballers, that sort of thing. Um, and essentially, we kind of are running along and we turn quickly and the cruciate goes as we put a lot of strain onto it. Um, dogs have a relatively much weaker cruciate than, than we do. So we do see it in dogs which are turning really, really quickly, 
we do definitely fly ball that sort of thing uh, especially the ones that perhaps aren't fit enough for it uh, the ones that are perhaps a little bit overweight or coming back into it from uh, a period of rest um, and again it's because we get this sudden impact coming forward there and their cruciates just aren't strong enough dogs being dogs that they are um, more likely to go there are some dogs as well which have a, a steep what this is called a tibial plateau and we can measure the angle and if that angle is too steep then it can predispose them to that because it's constantly under under pressure so if you imagine the cranial cruciate or anterior cruciate you know it's stopping this from falling forward well if that was um, cantered uh, kind of that way it creates a ramp and it's constantly under pressure so the, the cruciate is constantly under pressure so there are some bigger dogs sort of your uh, german shepherds rottweilers that sort of thing that can be predisposed to it so dogs genetically as a breed are more likely to get it it's a confirmation, uh, really. yeah i guess so yeah yeah i guess it's like you know how how are their bones put together yeah as well as how thick is that that cruciate ligament um so with regards to this particular injury it's something that we see quite a lot of and there are an awful lot of ways of of treating it um, this is what it looks like inside um, a joint so this is in, so you're talking about all these fibrinny bits this is all the damage that's been there's the cruciate that's just snapped into there there's some healing going on there blurred and all that sort of thing in there so all this is essentially going to turn into arthritis. We all talk about arthritis. Do we all have, you know, kind of an inkling of what we're talking about? You know, osteoarthritis, this idea that, you know, all that inflammation that you see there eventually, itis means inflammation, arthra means um, joint, so joint inflammation. Really, it's osteoarthritis, so bony joint inflammation. And what we tend to find is that all that kind of inflammation produces fibrous tissue and then we get bone buildup around the joint. And once we start to see bone buildup around the joint, there's very little that we can do to reverse that apart from joint replacement. So what can we do to, to fix cruciates? Um, we talked a little bit about the, 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 risk, the risk factors of cruciate um, disease. Um, conservative management. By conservative we man management we see put them in a box for six weeks and let's hope that something will happen and you know for little dogs under 10 kilos you know papillons for instance um, that's actually pretty good what we're trying to do is all the sort of ligaments around the joint what we're trying to encourage them to do is, is, is thicken up and essentially stabilize that joint so um, it's not going to be as good as the cruise ship but because they're only 10 kilos they're massively over engineered for what, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and so it seems to be pretty um, pretty successful once you start getting above the 10 kilos you're going to see some problems you know permanent lameness did you say your your dog has uh, had a cruciate issue Mine. yeah who was it yeah yeah I've had two that have had them done. yeah well interest well on the same dog or one had both done yeah one had one done. did you know that if a dog ruptures a cruciate it has a 50 percent chance of rupturing the other cruciate within 12 months Is that that would be one of the factors but also if it's ruptured that cruciate there is probably a genetic predisposition towards cruciate rupture as well you so probably had a few fibers go almost like a chronic thing yeah potentially haven't you a few yeah. fibers go a few fibers go so you would like you've got a few fibers that's on yeah so these that's cruciate already, yeah and then it's yeah so it's not like a wire this cruciate when you saw it there you saw how fibrous it was it's actually more like a, a ribbon i'd say when you look at it so it's quite thin and quite wide and what you can sometimes see is when you stick a scope in and look at these guys, there's um, like just uh, fi you know, like strands just starting to come away at the, at the side. And we can get this syndrome where you get like a, um, a partial rupture of the cruciate ligament. So they've kind of gone halfway through and they're, they're just waiting to go. There are things that we can do to, to, to help that. And of course, if it's gone halfway through, um, it's going to stretch more because these things are slightly elastic and stretchy. And if half of it has gone, you're going to get more stretchiness. You're going to get the pain coming in because of that, that meniscus being ground as well at the same time. Um, this is what my old boss would have done 30 years ago. He would have pulled a load of blood out and stuck it into the joint. That's been shown to be no better than just conservative management. Um, so 
if you've got a partial rupture, so this is something now that, so we do a test. We, what we do is when, we, when they come in, they come in, they look like they're, 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 they're on high heels. And generally the history is they go acutely lame and then they get better because things tend to sort of tighten up around the joint. And then they slowly get worse again over, over the next few weeks after that. Um, when you stick a scope in, if it's a partial rupture, um, then what you can do is you can put some stem cells in there. And that has been shown to be as... Uh, as good as any of these surgeries that we've got here as well. So it's actually quite a useful thing to, to do, to, to actually, after the vet has had a little feel, we do something called a cranial draw test where we try and move this um, backwards and forwards and we do the tibial thrust test to try and assess just how much of this movement that we're getting in there. Um, then it's worthwhile sticking a scope in and seeing, because if it's not a partial, if it's only a partial um, cruciate tear, it may be that just a, some kind of stem cell procedure will save you having to do all this. And in those cases, what we're expecting is the stem cells to migrate onto the uh, ligament and kind of what we see uh, uh, is that the ligament heals much quicker. So that's something that's been, only been found in the last last few months or so. I was down at a lecture in London about that. Um, those fans, the femur joint as well, doing the no, 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 no. If there's damaged bits of cartilage flapping up, yeah, you can burr that back. Um, but no, you don't. Don't. No, not not really. Um, so these are the kind of uh, surgeries that are available. These are the old forms of surgeries: the over-the-top, the de Angelis suture, uh, tightrope procedure. Do you know what procedure your your dog had? Uh, TTA. TTA. Okay, good. Uh, so De Angelis suture was this kind of big fishing line that you put down the outside. Over the top was we used to peel off a piece of um, patella ligament, feed it through and screw it back on. And we were seeing about 70% success rate with that. These, these three at the bottom are the, the, the favoured ones to go for now. Um, so TTO is kind of a combination of these two. So I won't talk about it too much because there aren't many people doing it. Because if you're going for surgery, you're going to go for one of these two. So TPLO, I suppose, started in the early 2000s. And remember I was saying about that plateau angle, what we're doing is we're sawing off the top of the bone and we're twisting it and then plating it back into place again. Um, and it was all, it, it, it kind of revolutionized how we um, treat cruciates. Because just removing that strain, that, that, that angle of the, of the tibia, which is forcing it to fall forwards, Actually, you you don't you obviate the need for a ligament. The ligament you don't need a ligament anymore. So we don't need to put all these prosthetics in, because prosth prosthetics, a bit like orthotics, they fail over time. You know, nothing is as tough as a ligament. You know, you, you put a piece of thick, hundred pound breaking strain nylon in there, it will fail given enough time. And these dogs are running up and down on it for two years or, or whatever. And in fact, the average time to failure of these things, I think, was about six weeks in one study. So you know it's, the, you know our joints, you know they get undergo an, an awful lot of abuse. TTA uh, uh, came along about uh, I don't know five, seven or eight years ago now. Two different types. Um, there's the cage version and there's the titanium foam version. Um, and essentially, TPLO um, is a a procedure which is extremely person intensive and takes an awful lot of measurement to get the angle just right and if you make a mistake when you're plating the bone you've essentially created a broken bone and so you know the failures are catastrophic whereas with TTAs um, a tibial tuberosity advancement even if they fail the dog is pretty much no worse than when it started off so these are becoming much more common now um, and talking to um, specialists last year at the London Vet Show I was talking we always used to, any dog over 40 kilos, we'd say go for TPLO over TTA. But now studies have shown that if they're adequately performed, competently performed, a TTA is the equal of TPLO in vir virtually every situation. Um, so what, what is a TTA? A tibial tuberosity advancement. So what we do, this is the tibia. We put a guide in here. Um, we cut off. This is the bit where the patella ligament fixes onto. Um, we make a wedge. And this is just showing how we make the wedge. 
anchor this saw guide in, the saw comes in, um, and then in this case what you'll see is we're putting wedges in, slowly bringing that out. <laughs> Don't get it too deep. Uh, the cage, you put a cage in, you kind of crank it open, and then that's the titanium foam wedge going in. And then we pin it, and essentially by moving this insertion of the straight patella ligament forward, like I say, that's what uh, means we don't have to go into, into the joint. And actually, so long as it's a relatively fresh injury, um, you shouldn't, you know, and there's no meniscal damage, you shouldn't even have to open the joint because every time you open the joint, you, you increase the risk of putting infection in there, you're causing trauma to it, that sort of thing. So that's TTAs in about three minutes. Has anybody got any questions about, about TTAs? What's the wedge made of? So in this case, it's made of titanium and it's bubble titanium. So every bubble that you see there, I wish I brought one with me actually communicates with another bubble so bone kind of can grow through it um, the reason why I opted for this over the cage the cage is like basically think of like a scissor jack or something like that it's got screws in it that you open up and push it forward that's just uh, plain metal and implants any kind of uh, pin or anything that you have can get infected because you've got like a, a bone metal interface and, and obviously you know tissue doesn't particularly like metal it simply has a mild reaction to it um, with these uh, with these uh, wedges what we find is that the bone actually grows in and through it carrying all the blood vessels with it and so they're much more resistant to infection but yeah I mean the people who do you know uh, the other one will you know say that these in actual fact probably the outcomes are about the same it's just whichever one that you prefer as a surgeon and I, personally I prefer this procedure that's why I've done a video of it. Um, so yeah, um, looks eight o'clock already. Um, medial shoulder instability. Has anybody come across this? Hot topic at the moment, I think. Um, so this is so when we talk about the shoulder, there is a number of structures underneath the shoulder, and when dogs are turning quickly, they can rupture these structures. Uh, again, athletic drugs. So. We're looking at the, the subscapularis muscle and the medial glenohumeral ligament. The glenoid cavity is sort of here, just so that's the bit that your humerus fits into. Uh, so medial means on the inside, essentially. So what you find with these dogs is that when you get them and you pull the leg out like that, rather than getting to a certain point and stopping, they actually kind of go out to this sort of area here. And actually, we're finding that this is underdiagnosed. So things that were being sort of written off as shoulder arthritis, um, bicipital groove tenosynovitis, you know, sort of RSI of, of, of the, the, the point of the shoulder are actually turning out to be this. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. And I would say that whenever you get like an option list of 10, because none of them work very well. <laughs> so we can transpose ten. It's an incredibly difficult area to get to. You've got to dangle them upside down to get into it all. You try and reconstruct ligaments. You know, like I say, ligaments go undergo a, a lot of abuse, and putting nylon sutures in them, you are relying so much on the physios to to get that thing to heal properly afterwards. Imbrication means basically taking the capsule and, and tightening it up. Probably one of the things that um, the, the two procedures which we see most are tightrope procedure which is basically an implant in there putting in a false ligament or what's quite nice is sticking a scope in and looking at the opposite side of, of, of the joint capsule and then shining a laser through it and burning the joint capsule and if you ever see I don't know if you like chicken skin it kind, kind of shrinks down a little bit when you get a laser on it really shrinks down if you do it in certain areas you can tighten up the whole whole area and basically then rather than being slack it brings the dog's leg in because obviously the dog's leg is kind of outside its normal range of motion it's more likely to to injure itself so this is what we call the abduction test and i would say that any any dog now that has got some kind of shoulder injury i quite like to do this because it's telling me you know how much how much play is in the joint um so you know again don't don't just get written off with painkillers and let's see see what happens you know very very simple test to, to do and here's a, a video of a guy that I found doing it so he's straightening the leg out and then what he's doing he's 
he's putting pressure outwards whilst keeping his fingers on, on the shoulder joint now he's trying to just see how much play is within the joint you know it's a good thing to go home and, and have a little feel at because there shouldn't be much play there at all but these dogs that are injured you know they're, they're pretty sore um yeah yeah it's not yeah 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 it, it tends to be a high impact immediate damage type type injury this rather than the, i'm sure that there is a slow build up to it which you're just not seeing and then suddenly bang it goes look at that we're 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 an hour gone um and we're like halfway through i'll speed up a little bit again you know we talk about cartilage damage this is cartilage damage those are all the fibrin bits that you're talking about you know we can go in and we can we can burr these bits off and clean them back um they are part of the healing thing i think in the old days you know everyone used to go in and just clean everything out and it was brute you know brutalectomies i think there's a much more considered approach to these sort of things now um so getting on to intraarticular therapies um steroids okay steroids are cheap they're readily available they're easy to get hold of and they produce profound improvements within days and then six weeks later you kind of back to where you started and the second time you do it mm, mm, it's okay the third time makes no difference at all and all that so does everybody know what a steroid does we're talking about well prednisolone corticosteroids cortisone that sort of thing that all the rage in humans you know i know my father-in-law had been recommended to go and get a cortisone injection into his into his knee and i was saying for god's sake think about it because the way steroids work is we're talking about the inflammatory cascade they stop that inflammatory cascade and if you don't get the inflammatory cascade you don't get healing now like i said our bodies are very dynamic when i'm walking around i'm causing little bits of damage to my muscles which are being healed as i go so it's a constant sort of fight between good and evil going on going on in our bodies the whole time you've got the healing side and you've got the damage side which ultimately should improve should improve us but we're blo when we put steroids in we're blocking that healing so actually the damage starts to overtake the healing so you might feel better because you've stopped that inflammation you've stopped those pain chemicals actually go into your brain but actually the underlying problem is getting worse so steroids have a, have a multitude of effects you know they, they inhibit the immune system so by inhibiting the immune system you're more likely to get things like ruptured cru cruciates you're more likely to get infections they thin the skin they cause weight deposition they cause liver and kidney problems they cause bone de demineralization as well so ultimately I don't like them, but I do use them occasionally. Old, really old dogs sometimes where there's just nothing else that you can do. You know, a jab of steroids, say, into a really twisted, bent, car, you know, wrist carpus can really help them just to mobilise because ultimately it's like palliative care. Um, just to take a step away from steroids, then, so mm. it's that inflammation, it actually isn't bad. No, in, inflammation is really important. So when we talk about humans, giving it cold packs to stop all that sort of stuff actually is that doing a bad thing then so if you're then applying that to so I, I, I'll, 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 I'll involve my physiotherapy <laughs> colleague here but the, the, the latest theory is immediate cold but then warmth yeah. is what you're looking yeah, for yeah, and, and really it doesn't stop the entire process it's actually more a pain relief mm. you'll get a pain relief from it from cold mm. um, and it's not going to completely stop mm. um, but you're right we talk a bit as Mm. Is yeah there's a reason for it like you were saying earlier yeah. as well you know inflammation causes pain why does it cause pain because it's a protective response this is the thing that to, to me i think says have you, do, when you've injured yourself or something, you took a painkiller for that no because when i when that pain shoots through that's a message telling me not to go any harder on it mm -hmm. you've hurt yourself yeah if you blank that out your body carries on I'm still fit, and I suppose that's the same with a dog. Yeah. Oh, I'm actually fit. I'll carry on and do a lot more damage. So. And you know, it's interesting you talk about that because you talk to the the old boys. They'll say, you know, a dog post surgery, you shouldn't give pain relief to it because it'll just go quiet. And there there is a logic to that, I suppose. But you know, that's, that's pretty unfair in my book. I would rather 
give pain relief and then do something else to keep them quiet or, or you know I've, I've never found it to be an issue but there is a logic to it that's why pain is there it's important people who um or, or that that can't feel pain they, they don't live very long because they do themselves damage um, so, is it, so it's, sorry is it just a prolonged inflammatory response and that's what causes further damage and that's why you might use your so th th there's an underlying reason for the damage okay so when you get this inflammatory response, it's in response to that to that reason. So, um, let's let's say a dog, an old dog that's got arthritis. We're talking about when when we're young, our healing responses are that much better. So, I go out for a walk, and perhaps I do a little bit of micro trauma to my hip. Well, by the, by the time I've gone, you know, gone to bed that night, it's probably healed. Whereas as you get older, it probably won't have healed. And so you go out for another walk. So there's another little bit of information, another bit. And it's just that chronic low-grade irritation on a day-by-day -day basis that keeps the inflammatory cascade going. So when you get that inflammatory cascade going the whole time, it's trying to heal it, but it's not getting anywhere. It becomes painful, it becomes swollen. Um, and ultimately, you'll get fibrin, uh, this kind of gooey substance laid down in the joints, which will then turn into bone. And then when you start getting bony spurs appearing in joints, you know, they're going to cause trauma as they, as they have little fractures and as they rub on tissues and things like that. So that, that's kind of the, the, the pattern that, that, that happens. So, you know, we, we look on inflammation as a bad thing, but it's actually our bodies are trying to heal. And, you know, the inflammation is kind of... Um, uh, commensurate with the, the, the degree of damage and how effective it is as well. So when you're younger, that infl inflammatory process, the healing process is much more efficient. Um, hyaluronic acid, anybody come across this? Come on, Leslie and the horses, you must have seen this. No, no, no. Yeah, really straight into the joint. Straight into the joint. It's, it's essentially like putting gearbox oil in. It's high molecular weight um, stuff. So, you know, we were talking about the stem cells go in and produce these synoviocytes, which produce more synovial fluid. This is just the artificial way of doing it. Now, brand new on the market, which I think 100% of polo ponies in this area are on now, are Arthromid or Aquamid. Anybody come across this? Okay, so I've used this a couple of times in dogs. I've had brilliant results with it. It's polyacrylamide. Uh, and polyacrylamide is filler gel. Do you know people who like to get a little bit of the old trout pout, that sort of thing? <laughs> it's, it's this stuff. It's, 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 it's plastic, essentially. Acry acry polyacrylamide is plastic. So injecting plastic into joints. I mean, the first time I, I, I read about this, I was, what? But actually, what it does, and this is going to sound a little bit counter what, to what we were talking about uh, earlier on, is it creates, it doesn't create like a plastic barrier in the joints or anything like that. What it seems to do is it seems to create a little bit of irritation within the joints. And as a result of that ir irritation, the synovial cells proliferate within the joints and produce more of this, uh, this oil. So dogs which have got arthritic joints and perhaps have had stem cells or whatever and they're not getting on, then actually, um, Aquamid has been shown to be really, really useful. So I, I've done it on our own horse, uh, my wife's horse, and he, he's come from being having really sore stifled to being sound again. And uh, I've done it on a couple of Rottweiler elbows as well. And uh, I've had some, I've had some great, great so results with this. So once it's in, it's in for life. Yeah, so yeah. And it, cost treatment? Well, it's one of those things that once it's in, it's in, and there's no going back from it. Now, there are a very small proportion of animals that have, have had a reaction to it. Um, not so many though that you'd say don't use it. So for me, again, working with nature, I prefer to go with stem cells first, and then if that didn't work, go for this, if cost isn't an issue, but if cost was an issue, then, you know, yeah, maybe I'd, I'd start reaching for this now, I think, yeah, so. Aquamid. It was called Arthromid to begin with, and then there was some issue with the veterinary medicines directorate because they got a spelling mistake on it, and it was all taken off, and now it's called Aquamid, and it's supplied by... If you ever talk to your vets, it's supplied by a company called Nupsala up in Melton Mowbray. They're really good. Some of these um, treatments you've talked about so far, are insurance companies 
Yeah. These are all these are all, these are all recognised. You know, they're not alternative treatments. They've all been recognised by insurance companies. Would you do Artemid early arthritis or later? I think I'd leave it for later. I'd try other things first, just because of the absolutely irreversible nature of it. And that's I'm, I'm by by nature I'm cautious, I suppose. You know, and at the moment the studies are are only being done in end stage joints. Um, but you know, as time goes by, we may well start to get more evidence for for earlier stage earlier stage um, joints. But yeah, um, a lot of polo ponies because of the, the way that they use their joints, they they have um, issues with with arthritis, um, and they're they're having great, uh, not hundred percent, about eighty percent. And yeah, it's it's proven to be re really really effective. Um, we talked a little bit about um, arthritic joints, and I thought it'd be quite interesting. Um, just to take you through what we do in hip replacements, um, because everyone talks about hip replacements. Hip replacements are really finicky. You have to be really, really precise. Um, what we're doing is we are cutting away. This is all that arthritis that we were talking about there. We're cutting that away, and we're going to replace it with a titanium, uh, titanium or stainless steel implant. So as you can see, it's all extremely precise. It has to be measured by MRI first. Um, there's an awful lot of experience to make sure that the implant that goes in there doesn't loosen off. There are two types, cemented and push fit. Um, and as you can see, it's it's very very it's very invasive. That that's the cemented version going in there now. Actually, in people now, they've got robots doing this. Uh, so that's the cement just being pulled off the side. And then you've got to, um, no, I don't know why it's gone back a little bit. Oh no, that's, this is the push fit um, method rather than cement. So you hammer it in, the orthopedic mallet. <laughs> that is a thing, by the way. We've got orthopedic chisels, just posh carpentry. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, the first time I saw a human hip replacement, I was like, this is like watching carpentry. Yeah, there you are, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweat going and all sorts. I mean, you know these these are t tough bones that you, you're drilling through and hammering things into. Those are push fit um, femoral implants. There you go. There's a femoral. That's a, this is a, a cement fit one. So basically gluing it into place, and then you fit the appropriately sized knob on the end. Afterwards, see the push fit because they've got this kind of serrated end there. It's just something that people don't see very much of, and I thought it'd be quite quite interesting to, to see. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, it's, you know, really, really effective at, at, um, if they're done properly and they work. They're really effective at relieving pain within joints. Yeah, it's also usually walking on it hours. yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Oh, you know, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, the, and you know. Gone are the days where you lie in bed for two yeah. weeks after things. Like next day, you are up and you are out of there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, and then we've got elbow replacements we're doing now as well. So um, collies, you know, they they do suffer from elbow dysplasia. Um, this manufacturer's animation of what you do. So how long since you want been out with the? Oh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, a couple of years now. Yeah. I remember talking to one of the manufacturers about this, and he was a, a great big, uh, tall Swiss man. Because all these things come from Switzerland, because everybody falls on the ski slopes, and so all the orthopedic development comes from Switzerland. Um, and I was looking at this, and I said, you know, come on, you know, how hard can it be? This, and, and he went, is very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really specialist stuff, and you know, you can see that the level of um, involvement within the joint is pretty high so you are looking for people that have done lots of these and do lots of these as well and I would always this replacement. Sorry. how active can they be afterwards if you've got sports yeah sports well if it, if, it, this. if it heals well then yeah you should be able to go back to some form of sporting it you know some sport. sort of, yeah you know the, the, the more the more you hammer it the, the, the more likely it is to and these you know these sort of things aren't aren't happening in five-year-old dogs they're happening you know, maybe they are happening in the odd odd one that's really severely affected. Well, they they were never doing fly ball before. They're not going to be doing fly ball later. 
I suppose eight or nine would be a more common age. Well, they're kind of retirement age. So it's just not an issue. It's not like us who are getting our knees replaced at the age of 50 and then moving on. In, uh, interestingly, I was reading a study a couple of nights ago about joggers and that sort of thing. And it was showing that extreme exercise early part of life actually can lead to problems with arthritis in later life. But actually, from about 40 onwards, perhaps because we don't do such high impact exercise, exercise has been shown to be beneficial for our joints. So there you go. Be lazy in the first half of your life. And then, <laughs> so, you know, I should be up in my exercise levels at the moment. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and now there are shoulder replacements as well coming out. Um, right. Um, and finally, well, there's a couple more slides. Um, what time is it now? Quarter past, so we're not too far off. Uh, Painkillers. So, you know, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, they are the mainstay, I would say, of most kind of medication regimes that you come across when, when you are um, looking at any particular injury or arthritis, that sort of thing. <coughs> non steroidals are the same class of drug as ibuprofen, and as we all know, ibuprofen is really tough on the stomach. The reason why it's tough on the stomach is because it blocks um, cyclooxygenase, the enzyme's called, which is really important. It's kind of the top of a layer of enzymatic pathways, some of which go to produce um, pain, uh, some of which are really important housekeeping enzymes. And one of the most important housekeeping enzymes uh, or, or hormones is one that produces the alkaline gel layer in your stomach. So if you giving these things, you're reducing that alkaline gel layer in the stomach so the acid can touch the side of the stomach and you end up with ulceration. So, you know, anytime you get Loxicon, Carprofen, Rimadil, Metacam, anything like that, you know, it's something that sh you should be counseled about really. Um, there are things that you can do to, to reduce this other effect of it. Um, so omeprazole, you know, Zantac, Ranitidine, that sort of thing, what are called gastroprotectants. But ultimately, there are some dogs which have really severe reactions to this. And there seems to be a certain proportion of dogs which, you know, almost within a day or two, they've got hemorrhagic diarrhea or they've got vomiting of some, some description. Has anybody here got a dog like that? More, it's more common than you might suspect. I have a dog like that. Yeah. I, I reckon about one in 20. So, you know, having one person in the room is about probably about right, actually. Uh, I've had it. <laughs> well, you've had it. I've been on naproxen. Right. Which is one for about 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've got knackered knees and horses. Is that rheumatoid and arthritis? Yeah, I had terrible pain and, and I had about three ulcers and it was yeah. caused by that. But but they healed very quickly. Yeah. I had to come off it for a while. Were you on what you on? Some I kind of omeprazole or can't move without it. Yeah. I, I take all the stomach liners. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's all, so it's same all these prisoles yeah. are yeah, they're but, all the same sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so probably, again, 20 years ago, um, there, the, further down the cascade, the COX-2 isoenzyme, as it's called, inhibitors came about, and they, they're the same class of drug, but they act on a slightly different enzyme. Uh, and so they, they, they still have some effect on the stomach, but mu much less effect. Um, and these are your Previcoxes, Onsiors, those sort of drugs that you see out there. So Rubencoxib, Firacoxib. Um, something I'm quite keen on and is something that we're seeing more and more being used is paracetamol coming back to being used. Now, the, these guys have a very strong anti-inflammatory effect at, at the site of the inflammation. Paracetamol just acts on the brain. It just blots out pain. Um, obviously not for cats, you know, quarter of a paracetamol will, will, will kill a cat but paracetamol can be used in dogs and there's quite a quite a big dose range in it as well so in humans we talk of around about 10 milligrams per kilogram so for me it's 70 kilograms that's 700 milligrams so between one 500 milligram tablet and two so 500 to a thousand dogs are second only to turkeys in their inability to absorb paracetamol so we can we, we at least double that dose and we can go up to five times that dose. So can you, can you use it long term? You can. you can. You can. Yeah. So for a 30 kilogram Labrador, you're looking at between. Uh, so what's 20? Uh, 2600 milligrams and 1500 milligrams twice a day. So between one and three tablets twice a day. And it's cheap. 
It is. That's probably why the Brits won't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. My heart, honestly. <laughs> um, I really like it um, because it, it's, it's quite a precise drug and it has very few side effects. It doesn't have the, the side effects of these up here. Yeah, my it's, old dog's like that. Yeah. Very, and I, I will often... You can combine it as well, and if you combine it with another drug, you probably because of protein binding and all this kind of boring pharmacology stuff, you should probably go at lower doses. And I would always, I, I would never say to somebody just go out there and stick your dog on paracetamol, but you know you can combine it. And we have these what are called multimodal approaches to pain. Now we don't just go for one drug and just keep increasing the dose until your dog is being sick and they can't take any more, and then we try something else. You know what we try and do is we block it at the site. So maybe we can use a little bit of steroid in the joint, if it's an old dog, and then we might give them one of these, and then we might give them a little bit of paracetamol. Pain's an interesting thing because, as you were saying there, Craig, before, it's a warning to us, isn't it? So when you're asleep, you don't feel pain. So pain is a consciously perceived thing. So we can interfere with the brain as well. So, you know... I don't know if anyone's had a few drinks and they've injured themselves and you just don't feel it as much. <laughs> so we... Uh, Explain yeah. <laughs> so something like... Uh, have I spelled that right? Amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, um, certainly for long-term uh, pain relief. So if your dog has got a long-term injury, I like amitriptyline because over time what you do is you get this what's called a wind-up phenomenon. So the dog um, is... Essentially, it's sore, and then because it's sore, it just kind of gets more and more sore and doesn't want to use it as much. And they get this kind of real fear about the whole thing, and it's like this feedback of a process. And am amitriptyline feeds in quite nicely, so for long term pain relief, amitriptyline is really quite useful. Gabapentin. So, if your dog has got any kind of injury which is involving nerves, anybody here on gabapentin? If you've got a bad back, you're certainly on gabapentin. Well, interesting. Yeah, I've actually got fibromyalgia, so I. Because it can produce a little bit of sedation to begin with. Yeah, it may, it, try, but, try not to, but I think I may have to go there. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, it's quite fascinating. But, but the sedation wears off after after a couple of weeks or it so. Does it? Yeah, it does yeah. improve. Yeah. yeah. I'm quite excited. It's one I haven't tried. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's a nerve pain. Okay. Yeah. Fibromyalgia is one of those kind of dustbin diagnoses yeah. where it's kind of... Well, it's quite interesting. It's, change, it's changing. Mm. A They're doing a lot of work. Yeah, We've got one of our nurses has got it, actually, oh, really? and she suffers quite badly yeah, with it. I meet people say, I know somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I very rarely meet people who've got it. Yeah, and yeah. it seems to ebb and flow and just be... Yeah, yeah. interesting. No, um, a couple of new drugs that we're using now as well. Galaprant sometimes and amantadine. Um, a, a mantidine, basically a mantidine we use to potentiate the effect of these other uh, these other drugs. We never just use it on its own, but we might use it alongside, you know, one of these to try and improve its efficacy. It works on glutamate receptors within the brain, uh, and then opioids, so fentanyl patches and things like that. You know, all all these hardcore things. But here, here's a really interesting one: tramadol. Yeah. 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 It's really interesting. You got a certain balance with that, and yeah. you got the balance wrong. She was completely lucid. I was on the ceiling when yeah. I had it. Yeah. <laughs> so the the recent studies suggest that actually, if you had a dog on it and it was working for them, you were pretty lucky. Only about one in ten dogs it seems to work for. No, yeah. So tramadol is is useful. Interestingly enough, it, it's all about how it's metabolised in the body. So, like you, you know, I came off my bike a couple of years ago and I was like, ah, oh, brilliant! I can take some tramadol. I mean, you can see why it's addictive. Um, but it is a highly effective painkiller. Interestingly enough, when the ambulance turned up and they injected with morphine, it had no effect on me at all. So morphine doesn't work for me, but I'm very sensitive to tramadol. So. You know, it's worthwhile mentioning that all these drugs, we can talk about what they do, but they have very individual reactions. Pain is a very individual thing, and we all have slightly different metabolisms with it. So in the case of tramadol, 90% of dogs metabolize it to um, something that just has no effects at all, uh, and 10% of dogs 
and metabolize it to something that does have effect. In my case, I metabolize it tramadol in something that makes me, you know, pretty mellow. <laughs> but then I didn't care about the pain and everything was great. Um, Can I do. I do. I, 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 I have a multimodal approach actually. So I would I, I do prescribe NSAIDs because I think they, they do give a nice um, pain relief. And typically when the dogs are coming into me, they've already been on them for, for some time, usually a few weeks. Um, I will combine them with paracetamol and I may well combine them with a little bit of codeine as well. So why would you do an anti-inflammatory, which I know doesn't take the entire inflammatory process away, but when you've got you want inflammation process to exist. Because I'm, I'm trying to block the pain. My, my, main, my main thing is to reduce the pain post-operatively because the last thing I want is a dog chewing and attacking the wound. And I find that the amount of uh, you're looking at the evidence about the, the slowdown in healing, it's not significant enough to put me off it. But you're right, it's something we're constantly working on. And, you know, we put local anaesthetic in as well to reduce the, redu the use of these things. And also cold compressors as well to try and reduce the pain at the site post, you know, for a couple of days po post-surgery. Because in, in the human field, post-orthopedic ops, mm -hmm. they very rarely prescribe an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Codeine and paracetamol. Yeah. Um, not seen them, et cetera. Mm. I think, you know... For, for me, uh, when, when I just use paracetamol on its own, I do see painful animals, and I want them up and using the leg, and I want them to be comfortable. Um, so it's a bit of a trade-off, I think, sometimes. So, it, you know, things may change as evidence-based changes, but at the moment, you know, all ours go on to heal, so why not use it? So, you know, from a purely practical point of view, you know. Um, and then I was just going to put in a bit here about nutraceuticals, you know, don't let your dog get fat and, you know, protecting your dog through exercise, which you talked about with the warm milk and stuff. Um, so, yeah, yeah, again, I've overrun on a talk. Um, it's a really quick skip through a few bits and pieces that are out there. Um, are there any particular points or is there anything that I've missed that you wished I'd covered? On the subject of nutraceuticals, I mean, do they work? There's only one that's been shown to work at the Royal College, and that was U-Move, which has got omega-3 fatty acids in. That's the only one that's ever been shown to work. The, uh, as I was talking to Hannah a couple of days ago, um, just because the evidence isn't out there doesn't mean it doesn't work, though. It just means that the studies haven't been done, probably. Um, but certainly glucosamine and chondroitin, they've done a few studies on them, and they've been shown to be no better than placebo. Um, that's not to denigrate placebo. I think placebo is a great. Is it, it's an old it's, doctor. It's the owners, um, yeah, both on both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, that I, I have certainly seen dogs that have gone on to glucosamine and have looked better within a couple of weeks. And people have said, you know, that they are doing X, Y, and Z now, whereas they couldn't do that before. So there's often a lot of factors surrounding these things because they don't just do that one thing on their own because they're getting different beds in or you know they've changed their exercise routine, they're going to see the physio, all these other things are happening. So I think it's a really complicated thing to tease out. But when they've allowed for all these things and done proper large-scale trials, it's U-Move. But interestingly, U-Move has got a big company behind it who can afford to do large-scale trials and can fund, fund an independent researcher to do it. Whereas glucosamine, anyone can buy it in from China and stick it in a pot and off you go. So where's the, you know, where's the, the financial incentive to do I the trials? Glucosamine, my dad takes that and he swears by it. Yeah. I've tried it yeah. and it didn't do anything for me. No, so no. I think it's in his head. I think yeah. it's a placebo. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing an interview with an old doctor years ago and they said when they banned the placebo, because they used to give like saline injections to people for pain, things like that. He said it, it re powerful well, yeah, cause it alters our perception. You know, getting on to another thing, you know, we, we talked about ulcers earlier on. They, they, they compared things like omeprazole to placebo, and placebo has been as effective. And that's actually putting cameras in and measuring ulcers. So when, when doctors say they know, we don't know it all, we don't understand why that works. You know, the body is, is healing itself because it thinks it should heal. How does that work? It's crazy, but it does. 
it does work. It's not just like pain and things, it actual physical effects on the body as well. Any other questions? Nobody's going to ask me about turmeric. <laughs> <laughs> CBD oil, yeah. No evidence for either of those things, yeah. but they might do. They might do. CBD oil, um, so turmeric, I think, is. Um, I don't know. I think it might come out. There was a, they used to give, like, you know, like um, chili peppers. They, they've got, is it capsicin in there? Now, that, that is painful because it acts on pain receptors. So, in the past, they've done therapies where they've like, injected pure capsicin and it just obliterates all the pain receptors. So, you know, short term, not so nice, but long term, hopefully numb the area. Um, that's why you get, over time, you can, you can taste, uh, you can tolerate hotter and hotter curries. Um, so I think turmeric, the theory behind turmeric is along that sort of line somewhere. I'm not entirely sure where that's all going. CBD oil, there's definitely a cannabinoid receptor within the brain, and there is evidence to, uh, to show that it will reduce fitting. But like every other wonder drug, it does everything. It cures cancer. It it does this. It does that. It's just been accepted as medicinal product. Yeah, yeah. It's just been accepted as a medicinal product. Um, I've seen some good effects with it though. So you know, I I can yeah. And, and the people that are are on it, they 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 they're very pro it. So in people or in animals? In animals. It has it has no euphoric effect. I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, in animals, uh, yeah, in, uh, in animals, CBD oil. They use it a lot in the States. They I do. I enjoy paralysis group, and a lot yeah. of them use it. Yeah, they do, yeah. There's a guy out in Colorado who's using it a lot, and he's got, a, I think he's got a company that makes it as well. And I think, you know, Colorado, Oregon, all these places where cannabis has been legalized, there's a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more flexibility about it. Well, but interestingly, license, of, yeah, you mean license? So it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been, basically if you, if you, if you are, yeah, so it's a veterinary medicine. So if you are now, uh, uh, produce CBD oil in the UK, you must have a, vet, a marketing authorization for it. However, the VMD, they, they insist on a marketing uh, authorization for where a product has a medicinal effect or where a medicinal effect is claimed for it. So if I give you a jar of water and say, tea, you know, drink, 10 mils of this twice a day and your headaches will disappear. Strictly speaking, I should have a marketing authorization for it. So there are claims for efficacy, you know, sort of le legalese around it as well. But there are more and more people using it. So it should so be prescribed by a It should be. Not just should put be. off the internet. Not just so put off the internet. Like, you can buy it on the you, can, you can buy a lot of things on the internet, <laughs> 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 Apparently. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Has anybody got any interesting injuries or ailments that they kind of wanted to, to ask about while we were here? No? Uh, well, only my, who you know, I've got a puppy on that's got luxating patella. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be examined him. And in fact, because we go over to France and, and the French vets also examine him, he's about a grade two, mm -hmm. but he, John and I have agreed, and the vet in France, that we won't do anything because he's. So he's three and a half kilos, and he's so tiny yeah. that you've said to, to so that, operate so to make another groove would be so hit and miss, really. That yeah, and also that, that you know it's so so little. You know, forty percent of the weight is built bared by the, the hind legs, so that's what one and a half kilos, so seven hundred and fifty grams on each, and actually, you know, the amount of damage that we're doing, this low grade damage every single time, probably not very much at all. So you know that the dogs, you know, a dog, a, a papillon it heals at the same rate as a Rottweiler does, but a Rottweiler does a lot more damage every time I mean, it he's lands. Never lame. No. He, he does agility to grade seven. He doesn't yeah. matter. I I swim him. He probably. No, I. Joints. He'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I swim him. I keep him leaning me because he's yeah. so tiny. Yeah. And he does agility to grade
because um, when he was very young, a friend of mine did say when he was sort of rain that he got slightly funny action behind. Mm. I mean, if you're, ever, if you're ever concerned about these things, you can take a sample of the joint fluid, just pop a needle in and take a little bit of joint fluid, just look at it under the microscope and look for inflammatory cells. Yeah. You know, look for debris that you yeah. know, associate. Yeah, but he's never, I mean, the only thing he ever does is if he, well, if he cocks his leg where an Alsatian has cocked his leg, he goes, <laughs> you know, do this, and he sometimes hops for one stride and then he puts it back again, you know. Three, three legs in a yeah. spare, I don't know, yeah. 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 But, but yeah. I do sort of worry and think, but I think we've agreed. I think, yeah. 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 Every case is different. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I hope you found it halfway useful. Like, yeah. Yeah. The new uh, fascia has become a significant thing in horses. Sorry? Fascia. Fa fascia. fascia? Fascial fascia. release and all this sort of thing. Oh, no, well, well, fascia tissue generally fascia, is yeah. victory much more in the action of yeah. horses yeah. and also become significant in human medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how do you, do you factor it in at all in the dog? So fascia is normal. Treatments and yeah. I, don't, I don't understand. So really fascia understand. is like fibrous tissue, it's like sheets of fibrous tissue. You find it between muscles, surrounding muscles, getting sheets of it through the body. Um, and it's part of the normal sort of um, makeup, I suppose, you know, how, how all the soft tissue fits together. It's like a scattering, I suppose. Um, so you have the uh, fascia can become damaged, and so people talk about fascial release exercises okay. and things like that. Very much a physiotherapy thing. Personally, um, I lump it in under soft tissue injury, which which will horrify the physios probably. <laughs> but you know, no, I, uh, it's, it's all soft, yeah, yeah soft it's connective tissue. Yeah. In horses, uh, there was actually a workshop um, at the weekend. And it's become uh, it, uh, it's become a much more um, that they're, they're using it. They're, they're talking about it biomechanically, mm. and they're seeing it's much more significant in the biomechanics mm. of the animals. It's probably something that it is under under uh, yeah, under and, and also and uh, because yeah. it's also got so much. Uh, it actually has a lot of nerve mm. um, and a lot of uh, effective communication around mm. the various networks. Yeah. So yeah. they're actually factoring it in much more. Mm. In some areas, mm. so you know, there's the old school and the new school, and then. Well, I've always thought we—I mean, I don't treat a lot of horses anymore, but within horses, you know, do we really get deep enough in a standing horse as a physio mm. to affect that those paxial muscles uh, on the back? Yeah. Actually, we're not affecting the fascia, which is then linked because that's the. That's really deep. The yeah, I mean, and it all links and trickles down because you know, a standing horse with some, its muscles some. tense has yeah, got yeah. a the point of the chapter, you know, you're going to have to work really hard to get down there. My hands are gone. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be labeled. No. I mean, sometimes you just don't know what you're working on. You can even say no. that as physios. I mean, years ago, we were all like, oh, we can mobilise joints and we can get those back joints doing this. And now the research has come out and said, you know, you're not mobilising no. the best of joints in a, in, a, in a back. You're actually having a neurophysiological effect yeah. on mm. the nerves and the fascia and the soft yeah. tissue in, in that area. Sets the body's healing process. Yeah, and, and you know, when I'm doing surgery, you know, you, you cut into a bit of muscle and you see it contract around you, and I'm sure there's a little bit of damage, and you get this tension coming in, and you get fibrous tissue. And you know, I, I really hate it when I hear about people who come out and adjust your back because you know, that, that horse's spine, you know, it's like this, it can support 100 kilo weight at 40 miles an hour. You know, my two fingers, I'm not going to do anything to that. You know, if I bought, if I can adjust the horses back, there's something really, really wrong there. Um, you're not putting vertebrae out and all that. So, yeah, so it's more n n neuro pressure points and things like that. Yeah, mm. I agree with you on that, definitely. Mm. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.